So our next speaker is actually pretty tough to introduce. Professor Peter Locks is a very distinguished career, and it is evidenced by his bio. As I said, they're online. Please read it, because it is more impressive than I can even impress upon you when I'm standing here trying to introduce him. So I'm not going to bother. Instead, I'm just going to turn it over to him and get you started. You need a green button. You need a red. <laughs> there's a there's a mistake in the program, so you're not misreading that. Uh, Peter's going to go first, and then Jim. So. Yeah, I don't have my military uniform. <laughs> first of all, I have to thank uh, both Derek and Laura for allowing me to sit in on their course, uh, and I did a little bit. Okay, uh, the idea was to figure out what they did versus what I do, and I'm a nerd, okay, so we do quantitative stuff. And uh, and so I was trying to connect the two, and so my talk is gonna be about that. But let me uh, start by saying that uh, I see on the program that says applying uh, systems thinking to complex water and policy problems. I'd say water is a policy problem, and it's complex. But I realize why you put water water right okay so so I so here's my systems thinker all right um, and uh, this is important I think uh, what I do uh, is uh, is is uh, form systems to, I mean I think what I do form systems thinking in other words uh, using uh, computer quantitative stuff and so what we do as nerds okay is to inform not to decide what the policy should be and so on. And just thinking that you've been hearing about all morning is important, very important. So, okay. uh, so that's me. And, uh, and what I want to talk about are two case studies where I think I do merge uh, systems thinking with, with uh, one thing itself. And first is uh, Chesapeake Basin, which is a bit about water. These case studies will be about water. And you can see the Finger Lakes way up on the top, all right? Uh, and we're up there. We're out of that basin. We're not in the Chesapeake Basin, just, just north of it. But the Chesapeake Basin is six states. And the issue in the Chesapeake, since I've been involved in water, has been how to clean up the quality of the water in the bay so as to have some fish, so shellfish to eat. Uh, and, uh, and so that's... That's the modeling uh, issue, okay? And here's a picture showing, you know, uh, two million dead fish appear. That, if you see that water, it looks like waves in the water, those are dead fish, okay? Uh, they're not massive kill. And then the bottom is sort of simulating what uh, the problem is, and it's hypoxia. Hypoxia means no oxygen, and no oxygen means no fish. And so the issue is how to clean up that bay. And uh, what's causing the problem Bay are the nutrients that come off the land in the whole watershed. And uh, so you're dealing with a really complex problem. So obviously, the approach we should take is to do some systems thinking, okay? And what I've learned in Derek's uh, class is that you draw diagrams, boxes, and you've seen that all day, okay? And so this is the, this is the attempt to draw a box. And you start, you start simple and it, it, it grows, okay? Uh, and uh, so what we do as nerds, okay, is take a conceptual model of, say, the bay, and uh, look at all the parts. We're doing the same thing, but we draw pretty good things. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and to try and understand the components of what's going on. Uh, and, uh, and so we develop a, a box diagram, but these are much prettier. Okay? And this shows that the nutrients come into the water, and it affects the, uh, the growth of algae. That's number uh, B, A, B, algae, algae grow and then they die and they settle to the bottom and the system uh, stagnates and stays stable. And so all this dead algae uh, sits on the bottom and exerts an oxygen demand because bacteria are eating it for food, okay? And, uh, and that causes an oxygen deficit and that causes uh, things that we like to have in the water die, like, like fish and shellfish, okay? And so that's my 
that's my uh, that's my I think um, and uh, and to make it more dirty, okay, we can make this into circles instead of pictures, and it shows that nutrient inputs on the top, okay, uh, 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 and uh, river flow cause the uh, algae growth. That uh, algae density and that uh, produces carbon and that produces an oxygen demand, and eventually it works down into the estuary where the fish are fed. And all those steps, we, at least we think about it just mentally and say, okay, I know what's happening, but it's, in, it's useful in my view to uh, try to develop some quantitative aspects to link those circles together as it should be. Okay. So that's what we do. We we develop these conceptual models, and then, uh, and then, uh, okay, and then inform, inform those people that are really the stakeholders involved in trying to figure out how their system works and how to make it work better. So we try to do it. Okay. So you need both. That's the, uh, that's the uh, message that I have for that. Okay. Now another study. Uh, second half of my talk is this Sandy that occurred, this storm that occurred over New York City. And uh, and it was a big one. And you've seen this picture before when Derek was talking about that. I stole, I stole that picture. OK. Uh, and it, and it, it raised some havoc, OK? It really cleaned up the floodplain. And this was an ideal opportunity, uh, ideal opportunity for people to think about floodplains, flood zone and rational behavior is to say, you know, these these areas are low and they're going to be flooded. And so uh, people that want to live on those areas should pay the consequence. They should realize that they could get the wet and, uh, and then uh, behave accordingly. And so what and so the flooding extent that happened in this part of the world was extensive uh, and the uh, Floodplain managers thought, okay, let's now we've got a clean floodplain. Let's raise the insurance, the federal insurance rates, to make it make people that want to live on those floodplains and on the shore think about what they're doing before they go ahead and do that and uh, have some rational economic solution to that. Okay. Uh, and so what we do is put the model together, and uh, the model starts from the fact that we're polluting the atmosphere, which causes climate change, which causes uh, uh, affects the probability of having a storm like Sandy. Uh, and, and then we have another model that relates the storm to the, the amount of flooding that's going to occur on the floodplain and, uh, and then coupled with the uh, measures taken to uh, mitigate uh, damages, we have a bonus. And then we have a model to, to think about what the political response might be for that. And then uh, Assuming that land redevelopment policy will change and that insurance rise, uh, it'll be fed back into what uh, the population does. What actually happened in this case was that uh, the public reacted to these increased insurance rates, and both Como and uh, the mayor of New York City. Went to those people and said, "We're going to rebuild. We're going to rebuild, and we're and, and the public reaction against the insurance rates was such that they wrote letters to Congress. And then, in two weeks after passing the increase in insurance, in two weeks, they rescinded it. Now, predicting human behavior is really tough. We've learned that, okay, quantitatively. And there's unexpected consequences. Okay? You've heard that expression." before, okay? There's always something that might happen that you haven't thought about, okay? Uh, and so the process continues, and it will continue, and there'll be plenty of work for our children. Okay, I'm not saying that is a whole time, okay? Uh, so we need both, okay? Thank you very much. Good night.